17. Luke chapter 17. They're all going that direction. I wonder why. Luke chapter 17. So in the late 20s, or the late 20s, when I was in my late 20s, it was, yeah, in the late 20s, I was not even thought of back then. In the late 90s, when I was in my late 20s, let's put it that way, when I was a young youth pastor, we decided to take our youth group on a, a nationwide trip across Colorado to Riverside, California to do a mission trip. And that church had a little bit of history of conflict and disunity. And so my senior pastor was a little worried that I was kind of a greenhorn and I was inexperienced. And so he decided to tag along on the trip as we took 45 people in three 15 passenger vans across the country to California. And so at the end of the mission trip, we decided to do a fun day and take the kids to Knott's Berry Farm as a way to just kind of wind down and have fun. And so on that last morning of the trip, one of the female sponsors came over and began to, to rub the back of a middle school boy. Well, the middle school boy had a, a sunburn. And so he just erupted and got really mad at this lady and they just had a, con- a confrontation. Well, this young man's mother was also a female sponsor. So those two female sponsors got into it. And I didn't know this was all happening because I was driving the van and it it, it reached a boiling point when we got to the parking lot of Knott's Berry Farm. And so these two moms, if you will, were trying to get people on their side and the, the young middle school boy was pouting and everybody was cranky. And so I get out to go up to the desk to get the tickets for Knott's Berry Farm and my pastor said, Sean, come here. I said, what's going on? He goes, here's what you're going to do. What do you mean, here's what I'm going to do? You're going to do it. I'm not going to do it. You're the youth pastor. We're not going into Knott's Berry Farm. You're not going to buy these tickets until these two ladies reconcile. Everybody's going to sit here in their seats until there's reconciliation. And I thought, that's kind of extreme. That's a little dicey. What do you mean everybody's going to be waiting on these two ladies to reconcile? And so he's like, this is what we're going to do. So I went to the one lady and said, here's what's going to happen. You're going to have to reconcile. I went to the other lady and her son. I said, here's what's going to happen. You're going to have to reconcile. You're going to have to get together. And so eventually, begrudgingly, they, they apologized and they forgave one another. And everybody erupted on the, the vans. hee we can go to Knott's Berry Farm now. And so, here's the issue, the the situation, okay? My experience all those years ago as a youth pastor and taking large groups across the country is that oftentimes I had more problems with the adult sponsors than I did with the teenagers. I've had my deal, I've had to deal with my fair share of conflict and disunity and factions within the church over the past 25 plus years of ministry. And here's the thing I've discovered. Oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes it's over petty things. It's not over the deity of Christ. It's not over the virgin birth. It's not over the Trinity. It's not over the substitutionary atonement. It's over preferences and dumb stuff that people just don't get along. So why is it so hard for Christians to get along at times? Why why do we see disunity and factions and gossip and taking sides among those who profess the name of Christ? Well, Jesus knew as sinners saved by grace that we would have conflict in church. We would not get along. There would be disunity. And so he addresses it in the text we're looking at today. But before we get there, I just want to remind you of Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. That's the overall teaching of the Scripture. The believers in Christ are to degree... They're to be unified, we are to get along, to forgive, to be one family. And so 
in our passage for this morning, Jesus addresses this issue head on. So if you have your Bibles with you, let's look at Luke chapter 17. I find it interesting. Last week we talked about hell. This week we're talking about how to get along. Jesus knows how to address some issues, doesn't he? So just right on, here we go, right on into chapter 17, right on the heels of what we talked about last week. So chapter 17, verse 1. He said to his disciples, temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. And the apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith like a grain of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he's come in from the field, come at once and recline at the table? Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he think? Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you've done all that you were commanded, say we are unworthy servants. We've only done what was our duty. Now, at first glance, you may wonder, well, what's the theme of this passage? It seems like a bunch of unrelated sayings that Jesus is putting all together here. And, and we're going to look at four. Jesus gives four brief teachings. And we need to dive more deeply into the text to find out what the unifying theme is. And so here's the big, here's the big idea for this passage of Scripture. Here's the big picture. Here's the main, the main point. We desperately need God's grace to function properly as the family of God. We desperately need God's grace to function properly as the family of God, as the church, as brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to function properly as brothers and sisters in Christ, and how we do that is we desperately need God's grace to be able to do that. So let's see how Jesus addresses this. Now, previously Jesus was addressing the Pharisees, but now if you notice in verse one, he turns to his disciples. It's very important. He said to his disciples, he's talking to believers. He's talking to those that are following him. He's, he's directing this to how we as brothers and sisters in Christ interact with one another. And Jesus gives four teachings, four principles, four truths that show us how we desperately need God's grace to function properly as a church family. So let's explore these four teachings. Here's the first. Don't cause others to stumble in their faith. Don't cause others to stumble in their faith. We see this in verses 1 and 2. Now Jesus says temptations to sin are sure to come. It's actually stronger in the original language. In the original language, it, it sounds more like this. It's impossible for temptations not to come. They are going to come. And the word used here for temptations, it's a, very, it's a very key word in the original language. It's the word scandala, where we get our word scandalon or scandalize. It means an offense, a trap, a snare, a stumbling block you put in front of somebody else that's going to cause them to stumble. So the issue is twofold here that Jesus is addressing. Number one, he's saying, you personally pay attention and make sure you don't sin. You personally don't fall into temptation. Temptations are going to come, don't fall into them. But secondly, he says, here's the, the bigger issue. Don't be a source of causing someone else to sin. Don't be a stumbling block by your bad example or by your behavior to cause someone else to sin. Romans 14, 13. 
Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. Don't put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of another believer to cause them to stumble, that they will fall into sin. 1 John 2.10 says, whoever loves his brother abides in the light and in him there's no cause for stumbling. If you love your brothers and sisters in Christ, you're not gonna cause them to stumble. Now, we need to be, be careful here. We need to understand something. The cross of Christ is always gonna be an offense. The message of the gospel is always going to be offense. The world's gonna look at our belief system. They're gonna laugh at us. They're gonna malign us. They're gonna sideline us. They're gonna say all manner of, of crazy things about us. They're gonna be offended by the message. And we need to expect that. The message of the gospel, the message of the cross is offensive. But listen to the wisdom of J.C. Ryle and what he says. He says, the cross of Christ will always give offense. Let us not increase that offense by carelessness in our daily lives. The non-believer cannot be expected to love the gospel, but let us not disgust him by our inconsistency. Don't let your inconsistent, careless life be an offense to somebody else. Now, Jesus is addressing particularly how we put stumbling blocks in front of other believers, I think, and especially new believers. Notice what he says in verse two. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than he should cause one of these little ones to stumble. Little ones. Now, who's the little ones that Jesus is talking about here? Now, some scholars would say he's specifically talking about children, and I, and I can buy that. It could be literally children, but I think in the context of what we see here, I think Jesus is addressing new believers, impressionable believers, those who are new Christians. In other words, new baby Christians need positive role models to look at so that they can emulate what it's like to be a Christian. And we don't want to, as more mature Christians, cause them to stumble, put a bad example in front of them. Now, what's a millstone? He said, it would be better if you put a millstone around his neck and he were cast into the sea. Now, what's a millstone? Okay, this huge circular big piece of concrete, probably not concrete back then, but stone that was pulled by donkeys or mules and it would crush the wheat. And so Jesus is using exaggeration here for, for an image, a visual image. You're tying this huge boulder around your neck and you're immediately gonna be uh, cast into the bottom of the sea. But I want you to notice the wording that Jesus uses. You don't get this in your English translations. The word scandala, at the end there of verse three, that he should cause one of these little ones to sin, the word sin there is the word scandalize. It's the same word used earlier for temptation. In other words, if you put a stumbling block in front of a younger, a younger believer or even a younger child, take it both ways, Jesus is saying that's a big deal. It's a huge deal. So the question is, how do we put stumbling blocks in front of others? How do we trip up others? How do we set bad examples? Well, you've probably heard this hypocritical statement, haven't you? Do as I say, not as I do. That's one way you can put a stumbling block in front of somebody else. You can gossip, you can backbite, you can try to get people to take up your offense. You can actually lead someone into sexual sin or into temptation or into immorality. You can be prideful and puff yourselves up and make other people fear and feel inferior. You see, the issue is, is that children, if he's talking about children or he's talking about young believers, both are vulnerable and impressionable and they need solid, positive role models to lead them into godliness and not into sin. Now, 
I'm going to pick on my youth group when I was a teenager. When I was a teenager, there were some high school students in my youth group that were not the best examples to the middle schoolers. So one day, and this was not me, so I'm not, I'm not implicating me, I'm implicating my friends, and you know who you are if you're watching online, and that's between you and the Lord. Um, so these older high school students were teaching middle school students how to play a game called poker, but with not, not poker, okay? I'm trying to make it clean in here for the adults, okay? That involves something a little bit... Um, Inappropriate. Okay, now guess where they were playing this poker game? On the stairs leading up to the baptistry in the church. Guess who caught them? The pastor went up there to try to get stuff ready for the baptism that Sunday and caught these kids red-handed in the hallway of the baptistry playing inappropriate poker. High school students being a bad impression on middle school students. They were being a stumbling block. And so we're not functioning properly as a church family when we put unnecessary stumbling blocks in front of younger, impressionable believers or children that would cause them to sin, that would purposely lead them into temptation. So Jesus says, watch out for yourselves. Temptations are sure to come. It's impossible for you not to be tempted. Don't fall into temptation, but... Not only watch out for yourself, but make sure that you don't lead somebody else into sin by your putting a stumbling block in their way. So that's number one. Don't put a stumbling block in the way of other people to cause them to sin. Okay, here's the second truth that Jesus teaches from this passage of Scripture. scripture. Second, seek reconciliation through forgiveness. Seek reconciliation through forgiveness. This is in verses 3 and 4. Verse 3, pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. We should not be an offense to others by putting a stumbling block, but we also should be quick to forgive when somebody offends us. Now, there's a clear order to how Jesus lays this out. If a brother or sister sins against you, notice what Jesus says there. If your brother sins, what do you do first? Rebuke him. Or in Matthew 18, Jesus says it this way. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. Now, what does it mean to rebuke? What does it mean to rebuke? This word means to warn. It means to reprove. It means to prevent further sinning. It means to express strong disapproval. Let me tell you what it doesn't mean. This word does not mean to humiliate or to make someone feel inferior. But what it means is you go to another person and you speak the truth, you confront them, but you do it with love. As Paul would say in Ephesians 4.15, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. So the purpose of rebuking someone that sinned against you is to do it in a loving way to prevent them from doing further sin, to, to confront them. Now, how should we rebuke? How should we rebuke another believer who sins against us? Well, we should do it with humility, not pride. We should do it with compassion, not harshness. And we should do it with a lot of prayer, not being impulsive. Galatians 6, 1 through 3. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him, how? In a spirit of gentleness. But keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he's something, when he's nothing, he deceives himself. That word restore, it's very interesting. In the classical Greek language, it meant to repair a bone or to repair a fishing net that was torn. The, 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 the picture is, is that you're mending or you're restoring relationships that have been broken. That's what your, your goal is, is to, when you confront, the goal is to restore. 
Proverbs 27, 8, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. So here's the issue. We need to confront. We need to rebuke. We need to address sin. You can't avoid it. You can't ignore it. You can't brush it under the carpet. You see, here's one of the problems that I found in all my years of of being around other Christians. We don't like to confront. We don't like to rebuke. Who here likes conflict? Some of you like conflict. (laughs) I'd rather just get it done. Um, Most of us, uh, I will do the silent treatment. I'll ignore them. I'll hope it goes away, or I'm gonna go find other people that agree with me to pick up my offense and I will gossip about them behind my back, but I dare not go directly to them and rebuke them. That's too difficult. That's too hard. That's too risky. Okay, so Jesus says you need to rebuke them. Okay, if he or she repents, forgive. Okay, here's the rub. What if they don't repent? You still have to forgive them. Even if they don't repent, you still forgive. Because notice the illustration Jesus uses here. In verse four, if he sins against you seven times in the day and he turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. Now why did Jesus use the, the term seven? Seven's kind of a perfect number, a number of completion. It's not like Jesus is saying, once you reach seven, you've reached your limit. If they they do it the eighth time, you're done. You've maxed out. All you get is seven. No, the point is, is that our forgiveness needs to be without limitation. Our forgiveness needs to be unconditional. Even if the person does not respond the way you want them to, or they don't repent in the manner that you want them to, if after you've rebuked them, you leave it with them and the Lord. What you need to do is to forgive them. Ephesians 4.32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. As God forgave you. I read this earlier, but I'll read it again. Colossians 3, 12 through 13. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. If one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And then 2 Corinthians 13, 11. Finally, brothers, rejoice. Rejoice. Aim for restoration, comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. The Bible is very clear that forgiveness is not an option. I remember one time, very specifically, a person came into my office and they sat down in front of me on the couch in my study back there and they said, God has not called me to forgive this person. And I said, you're not listening to God because God tells you that you must forgive. Well, that's too hard. Yes. I'm not downplaying how hard it is, but you must forgive. What if they don't repent or what what if they do? Hold your horses. You're called to forgive. Now let's ask the question, why? Why do we forgive? Would you catch what Paul said in both Ephesians and Colossians? We forgive because Christ first forgave us. Jesus forgave us without limitation. Jesus forgave us unconditionally. Jesus forgave us when he was hanging on the cross, dying for our sins, taking God's wrath that we deserved. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And so because we've been generously forgiven by Jesus on the cross, we in turn generously forgive others who have offended us. Now some of you are gonna object, and I know you are. What about holding people accountable? What about just, you're just enabling behavior, Pastor Sean? What about church discipline? Yes, those are very legitimate questions and that's another sermon. And I can talk for days about those subjects. But for this particular passage of scripture, let's just stick with what Jesus says. You confront them, they repent, even if they don't repent, you forgive. We must forgive. Now, what does a lack of forgiveness look like? Remember, we're talking about brothers and sisters in Christ being the family of God. What does it look like when there's a lack of forgiveness? 1 Corinthians 3, 3. For you're still of the flesh, 
For while there's jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? When there's lack of forgiveness, you're operating in the flesh. You're operating in a god, an ungodly way. James three fourteen through 16. If you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For while jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. I've said this before. When you think of something demonic, is the last thing you think about is disunity or lack of forgiveness or jealousy? James says that type of stuff is demonic. Okay, so the first two temptation or the first two teachings Jesus gives us here. Number one, say no to temptation, but more importantly, not just say no for yourself, but don't lead somebody else into sin. Don't be a stumbling block. Don't cause one of these little ones to sin. And number two, forgive. Confront with love and forgive. Now, at this point, I'm sure the disciples are looking at each other with eyes wide open. And they must have been thinking to themselves, that's an impossibility, Jesus. Do you know what kind of world we live in? There's temptations all over the place, Jesus. How are we supposed to say no to sin? Jesus, you're asking me to not be a stumbling block? That's impossible. Jesus, you're asking me to get along with Peter? That's impossible. That guy's always putting his his foot in his mouth. You're asking me to forgive? You don't know who I live with, Jesus. Jesus. You don't know who I work with, Jesus. These are impossible things, especially when people have hurt me really bad. Jesus, what you're asking is impossible. I can't forgive. I can't do these things. These things are impossible, Jesus. Yes, they are, which leads to Jesus' third teaching in the passage. Here's the third thing. Admit your weakness and your need for grace. Admit your weakness and your need for grace. We see this in verses five and six. Okay, saying no to temptation and forgiving others who have hurt you are probably two of the hardest things you have to do as a Christian when you think about it. Struggling with sin and dealing with forgiveness, those are hard things to do. Those are tall orders. And Jesus is laying these demands on these disciples that go way beyond their natural abilities. So what do they say? Look at verse five. The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. We need more faith, Jesus. What you're asking us to do is impossible. We're we're weak. We struggle with temptation. We have a hard time forgiving others. Jesus, we need grace. We need faith. We, We need you to help us do the impossible. And Jesus says, I know you're weak. And I know it's impossible. And I know that you are frail. That's why he gives the example of the mustard seed. He talks about a mustard seed here. Verse six, if you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it would obey you. Mustard seed was one of the smallest seeds in ancient Israel and when you put it in the palm of your hand, you could barely see it. It's like a little fleck, a little speck. You could barely see it. And Jesus is saying, that's what your faith looks like right now. That's what you guys are right now. You're weak, you're small, you're tiny. Yes, you are weak and small and tiny. But I can answer your prayer and increase your faith. So much so that this mulberry tree can be uprooted and put into the sea. Now, what's the mulberry tree? In ancient Israel, The mulberry tree was known for its very extensive root system. So much so that most mulberry trees could live up to five or 600 years. It's a long time for a tree to live. It's basically a symbol of something that's unmovable, deeply planted. And so again, Jesus is using these visual imageries of exaggeration to drive home the point. You guys have small faith. You guys have weak faith. I know it's impossible. And so I'm gonna answer your prayer, increase my faith. You're gonna take this tiny, weak little faith and you're gonna do something amazing by taking this mulberry tree and throwing it into the ocean. Now, Jesus is not teaching word faith, prosperity gospel thing, like magic tricks, like if you just have enough faith, you can do some type of of, of like weird type magic stuff. That's not what he's talking about. What he's saying is that this. Okay, think about what faith is. Faith 
means that we trust God to do the impossible in us. Things that are beyond our human capabilities. Now let's keep it in the context here. This is not just, hey, have faith to do something like outlandish that's not tied to the context. What's the context? The context is forgiving others, saying no to temptation. What's the impossible things Jesus is asking us to do? Say no to temptation, not be a stumbling block. Get along as Christians, forgive. That's what Jesus is saying. I can increase your faith to be able to do. Leon Moore said it this way. It's, so, it's not so much great faith in God that's required as faith in a great God. It's not the amount of your faith. It's who your faith is in. So let's ask an initial question here. Do you have faith in the first place? Do you have saving faith? Not did you go to church growing up, not have you been baptized, not are you a spiritual person, not do you obey the Ten Commandments. Do you have faith in Jesus Christ alone as your personal Lord and Savior? Do you know that he's your Savior? Do you have faith that he can save you from your sins? Are you trusting in what the Bible says about your need for a Savior and how Jesus is the only one that can save you because of his death, burial, and resurrection for your forgiveness of sins? That's the first kind of faith you gotta have is just the initial faith in Jesus to be saved. But second, think about this for a moment. Are you satisfied with your level of spiritual growth right now? I'm afraid far too many Christians are living off fumes from a past experience and they don't have a fresh relationship with Christ today. They don't pray like the disciples prayed. Increase my faith. I have a hunger and a thirst for Christ. Paul said it this way in Philippians 3.8. Indeed, I count everything as loss compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. We desperately need more of Christ day by day, minute by minute. minute. Why do we need more of Christ? So that we don't sin. Why do we need more of Christ? So that we don't become a stumbling block. Why do we need more of Christ? So that we can forgive. Why do we need more of Christ? Just because we need Jesus. So I encourage you to pray like Paul. Lord, I want to know you more deeply. Pray like the disciples. Increase our faith. In other words, what we're saying to Jesus is this. Jesus, today, I desperately need you. I need your grace. I need your power. I need you in my life. I'm not satisfied where I'm at right now. Please come to my rescue. Increase my faith. Give me more of you. I'm desperate. The disciples were desperate when they heard Jesus say these things. Increase our faith. Paul says, I want to know Christ. I want to know his power. You see, we can't forgive others without the power of Christ. We can't not sin without the power of Christ. We desperately need grace upon grace to be able to do what Jesus is asking us to do here. And that's why the disciples say increase our faith. So let's retrace our steps. Number one, don't be a stumbling block causing others to sin. Number two, if someone sins against you, you need to confront them with love, but you also need to forgive in hopes that they do repent. And three, we desperately need more faith every day to do these impossible things Jesus is calling us to do. We need grace. And now we come to the fourth issue of how to properly function as God's family. And here's the fourth. Serve the Lord with humility and joy. Serve the Lord with humility and joy. So Jesus tells a parable about a master and a servant. And so it would be like if you're a master and your servant comes in after working, 
you're not gonna say to the servant, hey, come sit down at my table. I know it's been a hard day. Just kind of relax. What you're gonna say is, you've done your work out in the field. Now come and do your work in the house. Serve me. <laughs> serve my meal. Serve my food. And then after all things done, then you can go be with your family. Basically, the point is, a servant's job was to serve the master, not the other way around. Let me give you some examples. These don't originate with me. These originate from um, Brian Chappell in his book, Holiness by Grace. But he says, imagine you're going out for di- to dinner and you've had a good waiter. The waiter's been really good and he served you his food and all of a sudden he, he plops down next to you at your table and says, you know what, it's been a rough day. It's been a really hard day. I've, I've ha- I haven't gotten very many tips. It's just been really tough. I think I'm going to sit down with your family, and I'm going to enjoy the prime rib, and, and, and I'm going to go home with you afterwards, and this is just going to be a great time. How many of you look at the waiter like, dude, your job is to bring the food to my table, and that's it. Beyond that, what right does, did you have to be part of my family? You're just supposed to serve me the food. That's your job. Or, or think about a realtor, okay? So this realtor helps you find a home and you're pulling up in the moving van and, and you get out and you start unpacking the stuff in your new house and you realize your realtor is already there. They've unpacked all their stuff. They put a large screen TV in there and her kids are running around in there and you look at her like, what are you doing? Oh, well, we thought we'd just come in and live with you. No, your job was to find me a home but not to come live with me. See, these are outrageous type of things that the original audience would have resonated with, outrageous behavior. And so what Jesus is saying is, listen, servants are supposed to serve their master, and that's what they're supposed to do. And look at verse 10. You also, when you've done all that you were commanded, say, we were unworthy servants. We've only done what was our duty. Here's the point. God does not owe us anything. And we serve Jesus not to get stuff out of him like a cosmic vending machine so that he will bless us or try to earn more of God's love. We simply serve the Lord because it's our joy to do so. Even if you serve God perfectly, think about this. If you serve God perfectly, you'd just be doing what God expected. You can't add anything to God. You can't give anything to God. You owe everything to God as a servant. So you can't somehow get into God's family by doing more or earning his love or trying harder to somehow be accepted. You can't do that. It has to be a gift of grace. As John the Baptist would say in John 3, 27, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it's given to him from heaven. It's not like if you work for God, you can get extra credit. I'm gonna do more stuff for God so I get extra credit. He loves me more if I do more. If I do more, God will love me more. No, that's not the way it works. You don't deserve anything. God's the master and he chooses to give you grace because he has the right to give you grace. You don't earn it, you can't deserve it, you can't work for it. But think about serving though. When we serve others in the life of the church, what do we need? We need grace to serve others with joy and humility. That's why Peter would say in 1 Peter 4, 11, whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever, amen. If you're serving, you're serving by the strength that God supplies. We don't serve to draw attention to ourselves. We don't serve God to try to earn extra credit. We don't serve to make others look at us or to make God look at us or God love us more or try to manipulate him. We simply serve because it's our joy to do so because God's the master and we're the servant. And we serve him out of joy because we know we deserve nothing but his justice in hell, but God has shown us mercy on the cross. It's like what Paul would say in 1 Timothy 1.15. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm the foremost. I'm the worst of sinners, but God saved me by grace. I'm not gonna boast. I'm not gonna try to earn God's approval. I'm not gonna try to look good in front of other people. I'm just gonna realize God has showered me with grace. I'm gonna serve him with joy. Galatians 6, 14. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. At the end of the day, we are unworthy servants. 
just doing what we're supposed to do. We can't earn God's favor. We don't deserve God's favor. God chooses to save us by grace. But think about who Jesus was. Jesus was the worthy servant. Jesus, do you think, think about this. Jesus, when he came to earth, he came to serve us. He served us by dying on the cross for our sins. He served us by rising again from the grave. And he is Lord and master in heaven. And he is king of kings and Lord of lords. And we don't deserve to be served. But here's the beauty. Okay, there's a role reversal in this parable. The whole issue is, why in the world would the master invite the servants to the table? It's their job to serve. What does Jesus do? Jesus, as the master, invites us to the table and says, come sit down and have a family meal. You're part of the family. You belong here. I died for you. I rose again for you. And God has adopted you into the family. You're not just a servant that just gets to be shoved to the side. You get to sit at the table. Sit down and have the meal. I will serve you with grace. And so here's the bottom line. We need grace. We desperately need grace. Grace upon grace to function properly as a church family. And so as we come to the Lord's table, I want to remind you of something. When the elders and the deacons go around and serve the elements, who's really serving us in the Lord's Supper? Jesus is serving us. He's the master who's invited us to the table, his table, the Lord's table. And as servants of the king, we take the elements with joy and we take the elements with humility and we realize afresh that we need his grace. We need his power. We're reminded of his cross and we're reminded of his grace. And so he invites us as the king to come to the table. And as we come to the table and as we eat the table together, I want to remind you also, the Lord's Supper is a family meal. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to meddle here a little bit. I do not like churches that give you a little cup on the way out and say, go celebrate the Lord's Supper out in your car because we don't have time to do it in the worship service. To me, that's blasphemy. And that would be a strong statement to say. Maybe not blasphemy, maybe ill-advised. It's called communion for a purpose. And the reason it's called communion is because not only do we commune with our Heavenly Father, but we also commune with one another. And so we take the Lord's Supper as a family meal, as brothers and sisters of Christ, and we do the Lord's Supper together, looking out at our church family, looking up at Jesus, looking back at his death and looking forward to his second coming, but we do it together. And as we do it together, we need his grace to be able to function together, to forgive one another, to not sin, to hold each other accountable, to encourage one another. And I don't know about you, but those are hard things to do, and so we need grace. And so when we come to the Lord's Supper, it's not a way to, to, to be beaten up by guilt for all the sin you've done. It's a way to be reminded that Jesus is serving us in the supper, his grace, and we desperately need him day by day. So as we take the family meal together, let's be reminded that the master Jesus has invited us to his table, and he says, come eat. You're part of the family. Do it with joy and do it with humility. So let me ask you to bow your heads this morning and let's prepare ourselves to take the Lord's Supper together. Dear Heavenly Father, we need your grace to be able to function properly as a church family. Lord, we want to be people that are forgiving we want to be people that are saying no to sin and temptation. We want to be positive examples to those that are younger in the faith and even those that are younger children that we have influence over. Lord, we want to serve you with joy and humility. We want to be united. We want to get along. We want to 
to be, be unified as a church family. And Lord, we know that that requires grace. And that's not something we can produce. It's something you give to us as a gift. And so, Lord, as we, as we take the elements this morning in the Lord's Supper, we're reminded that it is a meal that you serve us, Jesus. And as we take the meal together, we're reminded of your body and your blood, your blood being shed and your body being broken for us. And we're doing it in remembrance of you, Jesus. But we're also receiving grace as we do it to be both the individual Christians you've called us to be and also to be the family of brothers and sisters you've called us to be. So we need your grace this morning. We need your power. Help us be like the apostles. Increase our faith. We are desperate for you, Lord Jesus. Help us to enjoy this family meal together as your people, as you serve as Jesus in your body and your blood. And we ask this in your name. Amen. I would ask those that are going